Good afternoon, everybody from Jerusalem. You're with us again, day six, Maurice Hirsch and I, and our distinguished scholar, Khaled Abu Tuame, who is with us today. Khaled, it's great to have you uh, uh, with us. Uh, Khaled has been an, an, a distinguished scholar here, and so is Maurice, and we are updating you, assessing, analyzing, creating context and perspective for you on day six uh, of this war opposite the Iranian regime and its Hamas proxy and its Hezbollah proxy. Uh, this is an existential war. This is not an operation. Uh, it is the most profound armed uh, conflagration that Israel has been in, uh, in our estimate, um, even since 1948. It yeah. far extends the implications of the 1973 war, although we've seen similarities between the failure of conception between now and 50 years ago. Uh, but uh, what we're trying to do uh, here, what we've been doing for the last five days and what we'll continue to do every single day of the war is to create context about what Israel is doing, how it's uh, exposing uh, its uh, barbar barbaric and savage are two words that have come up uh, frequently over the last week. Uh, the, the barbaric and savage enemies that we face uh, I have uh, clearly uh, been exposed and we've received uh, enormous support, uh, as all of you know, being our friends, family and colleagues at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, among uh, the international community of goodwilled nations and people's uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, we're really uh, um, going to very, very happy to uh, have join us today, uh, Maurice and myself and the whole Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs team, uh, Khaled Abu Tuame, who is, uh, in our estimate, uh, in our estimation, probably the greatest analyst in the Middle East of Palestinian affairs and, by extension, Arab affairs. Khaled, thank you for joining us uh, today. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, Khaled, uh, we want to turn to you today to talk about the Palestinian Authority and Hamas um, as two uh, heads of a Palestinian leadership that the international community for many years has tried to differentiate fundamentally between the rhetoric, ideology, uh, political culture, if you will, between uh, the PLO Fatah, the uh, leading faction of or the dominant faction of the PLO and the PA, the Palestinian Authority, the international legitimized um, representative of the Fatah. And on the other hand, this uh, very, very savage uh, Hamas leadership in in uh, in Gaza. So we're going to try to help our viewers understand the contrast and the comparisons uh, between these two groups, because there is uh, there is a, a, an effort that has been made over the last several decades since the establishment of the Palestinian Authority to try to differentiate and call them moderate versus the extremist, radical, and and really savage. After we've seen uh, what's happened over the last five days. Uh, Hamas leadership, which rep which seems to be very close to ISIS in uh, in its uh, butchering, massacring children, babies, entire families uh, at, at once. We've reached uh, over 1,200 people have been murdered, if that number is correct, yeah. 5,700 rockets that have been fired. Just remind everybody that 1,200 people in Israel in a population of about 9 million, 9.2 million would be, would be commensurate with uh, approximately uh, 50, uh, 50,000 Americans killed in 24 hours. That would be something like 11, 12, 9-11s in one day. Khaled, help us make sense of, of uh, the Palestinian leadership, uh, uh, first of all, in Hamas, what they're thinking, what, what brought them to do this. And then let's compare and contrast with the Palestinian Authority, Fatah. How similar, how different are these two uh, uh, groups in terms of ideology and rhetoric? You know, then people like me who have been following the rhetoric and the actions of the Hamas and the Palestinian leadership, the Palestinian Authority leadership over the past few years are not surprised by these attacks. Uh, you know, I don't like to use that cliche, but the writing was on the wall. This is exactly what Hamas has been saying it will do. Hamas has been talking about uh, attacking Jews, killing Jews. Uh, liberating all of Palestine. They have been repeatedly stressing that they are committed to their charter from 1988 that calls for the elimination of Israel through jihad. In recent years, we saw an escalation in this rhetoric, uh, especially in light of the 
strengthening of relations, I would call it, between Hamas and Iran and Hezbollah and Islamic Jihad. So they've been talking about this. All you had to do was just to listen to them. Unfortunately, many people did not want to listen. I listened to what these people have been saying in Arabic. And in Arabic, they have been calling for jihad. They have been talking about the big battle that is coming with Israel. Uh, they have been hinting uh, at the possibility of, uh, you know, attacking Israel, uh, a, a, of, a, of a ground attack on Israel uh, in, the, in the last uh, week and in the last few months. They've even been carrying out drills in the Gaza Strip. Uh, uh, to, uh, you know, to occupy, as they call it, uh, Palestine, Israeli communities. Uh, so, you know, all the signs were there. Uh, now, when it comes to the rhetoric of the Palestinian Authority, and I've been writing about this for also a long time, it is not different. It is not different. If you listen to the rhetoric coming out of the Palestinian Authority, as we speak right now, if you watch Palestine TV and their broadcasts from Gaza, it's, you know, it's horrible. Uh, the incitement, the, uh, the, the accusations that are being leveled against Israel, ignoring the, uh, what sparked this, uh, you know, this war, ignoring the fact that Hamas uh, sent uh, uh, terrorists into Israel to slaughter Jews uh, and putting all the blame on Israel, Accu you know, accusing Israel of ethnic cleansing, uh, war crimes, genocide. This is the continuation of the, uh, of the incitement that has been going on for a long time. Now, both Israel, uh, sorry, both the Palestinian Authority and Hamas have in recent years been using the issue of the visits of Jews to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, to the Temple Mount area, uh, as, you know, uh, as an excuse to increase the incitement, the delegitimization of Israel, all these depictions of, or all these, uh, you know, descriptions of Jews storming the Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, the Jews are invading, the Jews are desecrating. Who was the first person, who was the first leader that talked about uh, Jews desecrating with their filthy feet our holy sites? Just to remind you, it was President Mahmoud Abbas in 2015, who, in a speech in Ramallah, he said, we will not allow the Jews to defile with their filthy feet our holy sites and every drop of blood that is spilled in Jerusalem. Uh, you know, th those who die will go to paradise, to, to heaven. Uh, and immediately after that, we had the knife uh, intifada, the so-called knife intifada. And since then, the rhetoric employed by both Hamas and the Palestinian Authority regarding what is happening in Jerusalem, what is happening at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, what is happening uh, in, the, in the West Bank is the same. So all this prepared the ground for such an attack. Uh, it did not come as a surprise. Uh, when you have all this incitement, all, this, all these allegations made against Israel in the official Palestinian Authority media, uh, in the Hamas media, so you could you could easily see where we were headed. Absolutely, Khalid. And I, I want to uh, just emphasize and then and ask that when we're talking about the Palestinian Authority leadership, we're talking about an internationally legitimized pre-state authority who is currently a non-member observer state of the United Nations, and you are talking about uh, Mahmoud Abbas and an entirely internationally accepted diplom even a diplomatic organization if you will with with embassies which is in violation of the Oslo accords in a hundred countries around the in in a hundred countries uh, around the world yeah. now um what I want to share with our with our viewers is that uh very much at your behest and and you've been writing this for years and years and years about how the uh, the PLO Fatah and the PA since 1993 90, 1994 the PA was established has been radicalizing the entire Palestinian public. Now that Palestinian public is now being represented by two different, a two, a two headed leadership, if you will. One is Mahmoud Abbas and the Fatah dominated PA, and the other is the Hamas. And, but when you talk about the radicalization of the Palestinian public, share with us, is that radicalization driving 
the the degree of savagery that we all witnessed here from Israel and around the world of de of decapitating babies, burning young people alive, sh uh, mass executions at um, at the dance party in the southern Negev uh, by uh, some three thousand. There were several hundred um, uh, Palestinian uh, terrorists from the Hamas who uh, who basically swarmed in the tradition of Islamic warfare, if you will, they swarmed the enemy, surrounded them, and basically had a mass execution of these young people. And the videos uh, from Telegram are coming out and, and, and sharing and, and, uh, and showing that. So can you share with us whether it's that radicalization that we try to expose in our Oslo at 30 compendium, JCPA, Oslo at 30 compendium, which, are, which you're very much a, a senior, uh, uh, you and Maurice, uh, basically, and Cooper and Yossi Cooperwasser, put this all together. And, and it's, I think, one of the most far-reaching um, pieces of content exposing exposing uh, this unlawful, malign, and criminal behavior on the point of the PA. But is, the, is that type of radicalization that the PA has generated, in your view, in the media discourse, the public discourse, the international, even the international progressive discourse of the United States, does that radicalization, what accounts for the for the unprecedented savagery, the ISIS type savagery we've been witnessing over the last few days. You know, Dan, the Palestinian Authority claims to be a secular organization or government or regime. But in the last, I would say, eight years, the Palestinian Authority has used the uh, issue or the controversies surrounding the visits of Jews to the Temple Mount, to the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, as an excuse to stir up emotions, to send messages to the Arab world, to the Muslims, which basically say, where are you? How come you're not doing anything? These Jews are storming the Al-Aqsa Mosque. They are defiling uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque with their filthy feet. These Jews are committing war crimes. These Jews are planning to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Now, th th these messages, they, they, reach, they reach the Islamists, they reach the Muslims who are, you know, in Gaza, who are in the West Bank. And how many people have carried out attacks under the pretext of defending the Al-Aqsa Mosque? So the, the, the Palestinian Authority has actually turned this conflict into a religious conflict by using the, or by inciting Palestinians uh, over the visits of Jews to the, to the uh, Temple Mount, to the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. So they do bear responsibility, and it's not stopping. You hear it from senior Palestinian officials, you hear it from the Palestinian diplomats, you hear it from the Palestinian media, you hear it from Palestinian uh, social media uh, websites and, and, and accounts. So I would say that, yes, the, the Palestinian Authority bears responsibility also for radicalizing Palestinians and for driving Palestinians into the open arms of Hamas, ISIS, and the Islamist groups. The Palestinian Authority, ironically, has emboldened the Islamists through its incitement, through its campaign of incitement against Israel, through its calls for uh, defending the Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, through its accusations that Jews are planning to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque, these uh, messages are taken very seriously by Hamas, by Islamic Jihad, and even by Iran. To what, to what extent, sorry, Dan, if I could just uh, ask a question to Khalid. To what extent do you see a difference between the ideology, the education uh, uh, systems, and um, really the, the entire messaging of the PA leadership um, and, and, and the Hamas leadership, is there daylight between those two uh, um, ideas or, or is it one in the same? To what extent are they similar, different? Are we uh, um, to expect a similar type of action coming from the Palestinians living in, in, in the West Bank in Judea and Samaria? You know, uh, Maurice, I, I speak Arabic and sometimes I'm confused. When I read statements uh, in Arabic, uh, I don't know who's, who's speaking. Is it a Hamas guy or is it a Fatah guy, a Palestinian Authority uh, official in the West Bank? I said the messages are very similar. The rhetoric they are using is very strikingly very similar. Uh, 
the, the delegitimization of Israel, the denial of any Jewish link to this land. Uh, the, the, these are all messages that you hear from equally from the Palestinian Authority, from Hamas and from Islamic Jihad. They all agree on this issue. Now, I would not, I would, you know, my, my concern right now, and I'm beginning to see signs of it, that the Palestinian authorities' uh, incitement, uh, it's over what's happening in Gaza right now, is going to, it could lead to an upsurge in violence in the West Bank. Don't forget, in the West Bank, you have hundreds of uh, terrorists in, in Jenin, in Nablus, and we haven't even talked yet about the Palestinian security forces. Uh, if this incitement continues, I, I would not be surprised if people in the West Bank also carry weapons and go out to attack nearby Jewish communities. It's only a matter of time and no one is calling out the Palestinian Authority for its actions. I didn't see one Palestinian official in Ramallah uh, condemn the, uh, you know, the, the massacres that were committed by Hamas. On the contrary, you listen to them and you see that they are, some of them are trying to justify it and say, oh, Israel brought it on itself and Israel, it's all because of the occupation and all because of the blockade and because of Israel did not give them more and things like that. So this justification of, the, of what happened on the border with Gaza is also very dangerous. And in the last 24 hours, I do see signs of uh, what I would call uh, an awakening in the West Bank. Uh, yesterday, there was a, a, a demonstration just outside Mahmoud Abbas's compound where hundreds of Palestinians were carrying Hamas flags. I didn't see the Palestinian Authority try to stop them. Uh, a short while ago, there was another demonstration by Hizb tahrir Hizb tahrir uh, for those who don't know, is the Party of Liberation. It's a pan-Islamist uh, movement uh, that seeks to uh, re-establish the Islamic Caliphate. And again, we didn't see the Palestinian Authority uh, try to prevent these people. If the Palestinian Authority continues with this uh, policy and with the campaign of incitement against Israel, uh, it's only a matter of time before things get out of hand also in the West Bank. Khaled, you're talking about incentivization, which we've been discussing together as we travel around the world together, actually, on behalf of the JCPA and others. What if we move from justification to incentivization? And, and you very much advised us, uh, together with uh, our senior uh, member and strategic partner, Sandra Gerber, who pointed out you know, already eight, nine years ago, uh, that the Palestinian Authority has a line, line item budget called pay for slay, where they pay young Palestinian men and women lifetime pensions, lifetime annuities in order to incentivize them and remunerate them to kill Israelis. Now, um, this is, you know, in the, uh, in the years uh, since Sander and you actually, and, and Maurice, who has been working on this for years, actually, even far more than nine years, to, yeah. together with uh, Palestinian Media Watch and the great work that Itamar Marcus has done. And then with us at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, where we have this major initiative called Palestinian Accountability and Reform Initiative, um, you know, that, uh, that we partnered with Sander on this and you on this. How, how meaningful, how consequential is this incentive program uh, called Pay to Slay which uh, up to 300, $350 million a year out of the Palestinian Authority budget is paid to incentivize young Palestinians to kill Jews. How much does that play into the context of, uh, of uh, mass murder uh, that we have experienced here over the last few days? Well, then, you know, we're talking about two things, money and rhetoric. Uh, this is what drives many of these people to carry out attacks against Jews, to go out and slaughter Jews. Now, if you're a Palestinian uh, in Nablus, in Ramallah, and you want to carry out an attack against Israel, uh, you know that if you're going to get killed, someone will look after your family. Someone will embrace them. Someone will pay them monthly uh, salaries. Uh, so that is that, that does drive people. It does incentivize people 
to go out and, you know, and continue with this because this is reassurance that, you know, you, you, you're leaving a family behind and someone will look after them. Or if you go to prison and serve time, you will uh, get a pension uh, when you come out or while you are still in prison, the Palestinian Authority will reward you and things like that. So we've been talking about, you know, the pay for slave for many years. And unfortunately, many people did not take us seriously. Uh, they said, oh, what, what is your alternative? And if, if uh, the Palestinian Authority does not pay money, then Hamas will pay money and Islamic Jihad will pay money and Iran will pay money. Well, they're all paying money. It's not that, it's not new. But what's serious is that when the Palestinian Authority that is funded by Americans and Europeans does it, then they need to be held accountable. They need to understand that this is very serious. Uh, so the money does play a role in this. Uh, in addition to the rhetoric, as I keep re repeating, the rhetoric is, the, the incitement is awful. It's been there for a long time, for too long actually. And this is why we keep seeing one generation after another raised on the glorification of terrorism, on the glorification of suicide bombers, on the glorification of, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, terror attacks against Israel. And this is spreading not only through the schools and the universities, it is on social media, it is at home, it is on the streets, you see it uh, in all walks of life. And this is very serious. So, so Dan, I, I just want to give you and Khaled and, and, and our audience a concrete example of, of what we're talking about. You can't just look at pay for slow as at pay, pay for slow as this as this abstract idea of people getting money. So let's let's give it a concrete uh, um, idea. Um, I received yesterday, and it's now been uh, traveling around on on social media, an, a video of an interview of one of the terrorists who in, who infiltrated um, from Gaza and participated in the massacre. He's asked by the investigator, well, what did you want to do with the kidnap of, oh, of, the of, of the women? His answer is clearly to rape them. This guy is now in jail in Israel. What does that mean? He gets he, money. He's from Gaza. If yesterday, two days ago, on Friday morning, he was one of the, the poor Palestinians, he received an allowance from, the, from, the, from Hamas of $100 a month. $100. Now with the with the change in the exchange rate, 400 shekel a month. Now that he's in an Israeli prison for murdering and attempting to rape and participating in the butcher of babies, the Palestinian Authority is now going to pay him and his family 1,400 shekel. That's a net profit of 1,000 shekel. Why? Because he participated in the murder, the butchering of Israelis, and in the, uh, uh, in the goal to, to kidnap Israeli women to rape them. That's what we're talking about with, with pay to slay, ladies and gentlemen. We're not talking about an abstract. We're not talking about just, it's nice words. It's important words. It's justification. It's incentivization. Let's give it a name. Let's give it an idea. We participate in the murder, the butcher of Israeli babies and children in order to get rich. That's why it's called pay for slay. It's not yeah. anything else, Dan. Yeah. That, that, that's what we're talking about. It's called, and, it's and, and this is not the separation between the Fatah Palestinian Authority and Hamas, the butchers in the south. Every Palestinian is entitled to this payment once he is arrested for what they term as fighting against the occupation. That's what it is, Dan. Yeah, absolutely. Khaled, I want to take what, what Maurice and, you know, Maurice, many, uh, some don't know, Maurice is a lieutenant colonel reserve. He was the former military prosecutor in Judea and Samaria and dealt with this issue from an Israeli military point of view all the time. And he's also an attorney. Uh, so he's very well aware of the legal implications of these uh, of these issues. I just yeah. like to sing your praises, uh, sing, uh, you know, yes. uh, 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 day in and day out, as well as they do Khaled. Khaled, I want to ask you a question about the Arab world, the Arab world. One of the issues that we're handling here at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs is communicating with the Arab world in Arabic every day, as we do with the uh, Farsi speaking world in, in Persian and Farsi every single day. Uh, uh, we've established at the Jerusalem Center very much with your help, Khalid, and, and our other uh, Arabists. We have a, a, a very large number of Arabic experts, uh, both uh, Arab Muslims and, and Jewish Israelis, both. Uh, and we are, we've set up, as, uh, with your, uh, under your guidance and wisdom, Khalid, also a, an Arabic 
communication center in the Jerusalem center in order to be communicating with the Palestinian public, by the way, and the Arab publics and the Arab governments. As Khalid, as you and I know, we've received a lot of very positive feedback from the Arab world about Israel's preparedness and, and, and desire to, to communicate both positive and, and truthful messages about Israel, our technology, our defense, what we're about, how long we've been here, uh, and our indigenous connection to our Arab Muslim neighbors in the Middle East on the one hand, and we found also, Khalid, that they are equally as shocked uh, and, uh, uh, and um, outraged. outraged by these actions of mass murder, massacre, uh, savagery, and barbarism by the Hamas. Are you, should we be surprised that we've received a lot of uh, positive uh, feedback under the radar? And how important is this JCPA Arabic um, you know, communication center to the Arab world, uh, which I think is the only one of its kind, just in terms of the depth of our content and messaging, etc. You know, Dan, what's encouraging is that I've also been receiving dozens of messages from people around the uh, Arab world expressing outrage. This is almost unprecedented. I never ever received such a large number of uh, messages from people in Egypt, in Jordan, uh, and uh, even in Lebanon, by the way, uh, condemning this and saying, wow, we didn't know it was so bad. Uh, and they're, tr they're, they're, they're beginning to understand that, you know, Hamas is not different than ISIS. And they're beginning to understand that, you know, uh, the, 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 the nature of the atrocities committed uh, by, uh, by Hamas uh, in its attack. And I believe that now, is the right time to increase our effort. We should seize on this opportunity and address more Arabs uh, through the media center uh, of the JCPA. This is the right time to bring all these people together. I see an opportunity here. It's urgent. We need to do it right now because if we don't do it, in, in, in a few weeks from now, people will, you know, they, they will just move on. They will forget. And I believe that all these people who are in the, the Arabs, and even Palestinians, by the way. Uh, we need to address them. We need to give them a platform. And I believe that what we at JCPA can do is very important. It's very, uh, it's urgently needed right now. And I hope that, you know, we will be able to expand this operation to reach out to as many Arabs, as many Muslims, and as many Palestinians as possible who are opposed to you know, these heinous attacks, these, these atrocities. And this is, it, it really is a game changer and something good can come out of it. Absolutely. I just want to ask you one, uh, one additional question about the West, Khaled, because you're an expert in the Palestinian, on the Palestinian accountability uh, and the leadership and its relationship with the West. Um, we're beginning to see a, uh, a duality in the West. On the one hand, supporters of Israel uh, uh, understand this, uh, this unprecedented act of ISIS, uh, what we call Hamisis, uh, uh, a savagery. Uh, on the other hand, there are more and more people in some progressive circles that are actually holding Israel responsible for the acts of, of barbarism and savagery against it by calling us, you know, imperialist, colonialist, as if we had not been here for 3,700 years in greater numbers and fewer numbers, but, but that we've been here as an indigenous member of the Arab Muslim majority Middle East. How do we, how do we understand this, in your view, um, this growing phenomenon in the West? You yourself have spent so many you know, weeks and months, if you, if you add up the amount of time that you've spent on university campuses, you've spent speaking to members of Congress, the Senate, and beyond uh, uh, in the United States, Jewish groups, how do we begin to address that issue now of the, the bifurcation, if you will, of the American uh, Jewish community uh, uh, regarding what has just happened now and, and about Israel altogether? Well, I think the basic, and I've been, you know, the, in, in many of my talks, and I've been talking to many American Jews, many people in the West about this conflict, and I keep telling them, look, I wish this conflict were about a settlement or a checkpoint or a wall or a fence or a prisoners or Jerusalem or Al-Aqsa Mosque. In fact, 
this conflict is about Israel's presence in this part of the world. And what we saw on the border with Gaza proves that this that there's still too many people out there in the Arab and Muslim world who have not come to terms with Israel's right to exist. They do not see this as a conflict over a settlement uh, or a, a checkpoint. They do not see a difference between a kibbutz inside Israel and a settlement in the West Bank. They do not see a difference between a Jew living in the West Bank and a Jew living in Tel Aviv. They are all colonialists, they are all uh, uh, settlers, uh, and they have no right to be over here. So once we manage to drive that point, that line, that this conflict is really about Israel's presence in the Middle East, and that th these people do not accept Israel's presence over here, and they believe that Israel should be replaced with an Islamic state, then people will start understanding the context of this whole conflict. Uh, you know, the, the kibbutzim that were attacked, they're not settlements. What people don't understand is that here we have Hamas invading Israel. We don't, this is not, uh, Hamas attacking a Jewish settlement in the West Bank. And this is a very important, important point to point out. Secondly, we need to point out, and I've been doing this for many, many years, that rhetoric kills. And that if you don't pay attention to the incitement, to the glorification of terrorism, to the delegitimization of Israel, to the denial of any Jewish link, any Jewish uh, religious link to this land, you are also uh, calling for genocide. You are you are emboldening the radicals, even, also among the Palestinians, by the way. And when you are sitting at a university campus and you are chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, you are actually echoing Hamas's uh, slogan, which is from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, Palestine will be free, i.e. we will destroy Israel. So it's time I, for many of these Westerners to wake up and realize what Israel is facing, that this is an existential threat to Israel. And if we don't start calling out the incitement, and if we don't start putting pressure on the Palestinian Authority uh, to, to stop this, uh, you know, then I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, it's only a matter of time before another massacre takes place. Go ahead. So, um, Khaled, we, uh, there, there are reports now that tomorrow, uh, um, as Dan mentioned, uh, um, some people don't really understand, accept or, or internalize the difference between or the absence of any difference between Hamas and, uh, and, and, and Fatah, the PA. Tomorrow, we uh, are hearing reports that um, the American Secretary of State, Antony, Antony Blinken, is going to be meeting with Mahmoud Abbas. What would you recommend that Blinken say to Abbas? Well, it's time for the Americans to bang on the table and say, cut it out, stop it. I mean, only just two, two months ago, President Abbas, in a speech in Ramallah, was blaming the Jews for the Holocaust, saying that they brought it on themselves. He was justifying it. Do you know how serious this is? Do you know what message this sends to younger generations? And last week or 10 days ago, President Abbas was again saying that this whole issue of Israeli independence is a big lie and actually it's the Americans who are occupying Palestine because of their support for Israel. I mean, what, what President Abbas is doing, he's, he is also inciting Palestinians against America. He's making America look like the big Satan uh, uh, and Israel like the small Satan. In, in that regard, his rhetoric is not different than the rhetoric of ISIS, Al-Qaeda, uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad. So I would advise, you know, the Americans, uh, uh, Secretary uh, Blinken, to point this out, to tell him, stop these broadcasts on Palestine TV. Why don't you issue a statement uh, condemning what Hamas did? Wasn't Abbas himself a victim of Hamas? Did people forget that in 2007, Hamas kicked him out of Gaza? And after killing hundreds of uh, PLO and uh, Fatah people over there, and even tried to kill him, uh, so you know wh why is why why are we in a situation where the Palestinian Authority president 
is not able to condemn Hamas for carrying out a heinous attack. This is, you know, he should ask him that question. Why aren't you condemning it? Why aren't you speaking out against it? To what extent, Khalid, and this is, we'll wrap it up with these uh, last uh, point. Questions. The elephant in the room is the Iranian regime. And we've talked about this for a long time. You know, that, that, that direct connection has been o- overlooked, underemphasized, or willingly blind. People have been willingly blind to it. Here, uh, you and I have discussed this for a long time. There is growing evidence of direct connection uh, on, in this massacre uh, that was strategized, uh, thought through, planned, and even executed through the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps of the Iranian regime using Hamas. We've seen Hamas uh, visits in Tehran n- not infrequently over the last few years. And, and I think uh, I know that the United States government has said there's no direct evidence linking the Iranian regime to this, uh, to this massacre. Um, but your understanding of the Hamas leadership's connection to the Iranian regime is, uh, is quite robust, if I'm not mistaken. Well, all you have to do is just listen to what Hamas leaders are saying and, the, and Palestinian and Islamic Jihad leaders are saying. They're, they're openly saying we are receiving uh, all the support we need from Iran. Iran is helping us. Were it not for Iran, we would not have all these weapons. Were it not for Iran, we would not survive. How many visits did, they, did the leaders of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad uh, make to Tehran in the past few years? Several visits, I reported about them. How many times after these visits did they issue statements openly saying, our goal is to strengthen the resistance, in quotes, uh, the resistance against Israel. I mean, they they were talking about it. They they were saying, uh, we want to destroy Israel. We want to escalate the, uh, the attacks against Israel with Iran's help. You cannot deny the fact that Iran is involved uh, in this in one way or another. Uh, and you cannot deny the fact that they themselves are saying it. I, I don't believe that this could have been carried out without Iran's help in one way or another. Uh, we, we've heard all these reports, uh, even from people in Gaza talking about Hamas people receiving, uh, uh, or Iranian uh, security experts training Hamas abroad, uh, giving them all the security and intelligence expertise on how to carry out attacks. And now what we see is the result of all this cooperation. How many times did Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad officials meet with Iranian uh, leaders and officials in Lebanon? We saw, we saw how Hezbollah was uh, involved in this, another proxy of Iran. So this is Iran's uh, you know, war on Israel. Uh, Iran is using its Palestinian proxies, uh, and don't tell me that you know this was carried. This was not carried out without Iran being involved. No one believes it. More, many Palestinians I talk to even uh, believe that you know without without Iran's help, this would not have taken place. Absolutely. You want to read a couple of the, the questions? Yeah, let's get to a couple of the questions. Uh, um, Rabbi Joel uh, uh, Schwartzman, thank you very much for your question. Thank you for joining us. Just what is our understanding about the strike for a group that the U.S. has sent to the, the Eastern Mediterranean? Is it only in the way of Israeli uh, superiority in the air? Um, so maybe I will uh, uh, address the question. I, I, I don't think so. I, I think the, 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 the U.S. strike force gives a lot of power and provides not a small amount of deterrence, both against the Iranian front and potentially even the Hezbollah uh, Lebanese front. Um, that's, uh, I, I think, the goal of that force. Um, the Israeli um, air superiority is against its enemies. And, uh, uh, and obviously, when you talk about Hamas and, and, and Hezbollah, that don't, they don't have air forces at all, um, then that is a, a, an important task. What we did see yesterday, however, in one of, one of the, the, the IDF uh, uh, attacks was shooting down a Hamas capability, an, a, an anti-air uh, capability, um, People think about Hamas and they think that they just have these primitive rockets. That's not true. Hamas has very uh, advanced uh, um, military warfare. They and, launched and, an air attack. They launched they launched an attack exactly. by air, by sea, by land, exactly. and by rockets. And that is a reflection of the capabilities that they've uh, received from the Iranians. Um, so uh, I think the Iranian, the, the the U.S. strike force here is a, is, is is a positive force. 
and not something that's uh, going to interfere. Um, Vivian Khan asked us, uh, uh, um, do we know if the terrorists were fighting under the influence of narcotics or intoxicated in any way? We would love to be able to say that there was some other intervening force um, that drove these barbarians to slaughter babies. Um, that's not an excuse. That isn't the situation. Um, they were intoxicated with hatred, incitement, as, uh, as Khalid um, so clearly uh, described the situation. That's, that's their drug. Their drug is the hatred that they've been fed on um, and, and, and have really uh, weaned on for the last 30 years under the Palestinian Authority, under Hamas, um, and nothing, uh, uh, um, nothing else that could have impaired their judgment. These were... See, Maurice, oh, sorry, this is, yeah. this is where Westerners can't understand the hatred. That's exactly the, it. And that's why they assume, oh, maybe they were on drugs. No, they were not on drugs. These people know what they were doing. These people are driven by hate. These people are indoctrinated. These people uh, are brainwashed. But this is not drugs. This is how they were raised. Yep, that's that's their drug, hatred. Yeah. Um, the last question really is for you, Dan, uh, and, and what we've been talking about for the last uh, uh, few days. Can you comment on what we know about the nature of uh, the connections in front organizations in the diaspora? Well, what we're talking about yeah. really is Hamas's popular support across Europe, even across the USA. Absolutely. And, and organizations that yeah. feed in both morally, uh, uh, given justification and financial. I want to make a very clear uh, declaration here as someone who's uh, spent an awfully long time writing, <clears throat> excuse me, writing policy books and visiting uh, American organizations of the intense and complete support for the Hamas, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and other radical terror organizations by hundreds of college and university campuses on which there are branches of the Students for Justice in Palestine and the Palestine Solidarity Committee. There are hundreds of campuses. You can look up what I'm saying to verify it on Google right now. And you please come to the JCPA. You can find uh, the links to SJP Unmasked, Students for Justice in Palestine Unmasked. Holland, you were very helpful in, in, you know, in these policy studies as well, as well as the PACB, um, uh, a pack be unmasked, the Palestinian academic cultural boycott of Israel unmasked. This unmasked the connection between the Hamas terror organization, which is, and don't be surprised when I say this, a constituent member of the Boycott National Committee based in Ramallah, meaning the, B, the so called nonviolent BDS National Committee in Ramallah includes. Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Palestinian Liberation Front, Palestinian, the, uh, the PFLP and the PFLPGA, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a Marxist organization, and the PFLPGA, uh, which is a Marxist-Leninist organization together with Hamas. So there is a direct connection between Hamas, Jihad, and the BDS movement, which is now dominating uh, hundreds of, of university campuses, and they are not in favor of Mahmoud Abbas. This is a very important point. When you hear Khaled Abu Tuami tell us again and again that the most popular refrain on these university campuses that have Students for Justice in Palestine, Palestine Solidarity Committee, and other pro so-called pro-Palestinian organizations, and they refrain from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. That is a declarative and morally uh, uh, clear from their point of view, support for mass murder by Hamas. That's very clear. And I, and I think that we need to be moving very, uh, uh, very, I think, clearly and aggressively to university presidents and university faculty to make it clear that this type of incitement to murdering Jews should not be covered under the first or permitted under the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. That is exactly it. And I think on, on, on that note, Dan, uh, um, possibly just to recall as a, as a closing note, um, the attempted uh, interview yesterday with a, a Congresswoman uh, uh, Rashida Tlaib, when she was asked if she was capable of condemning the actions of Hamas and she refused to respond. Um, let's just remind everyone that, that similar to uh, some of the UN organizations, those who refuse to condemn are there in support of the actions of the terrorists. Um, and that is a, a, um, something which we yeah. we also need to uh, deal with going forward. Yeah, thank you, Khaled. Thank you ever so much for this uh, briefing. We're 
going to ask you to join us again uh, quite frequently, you know, in the, in the coming days uh, to, to shed a lot of the context that, that only you uniquely can bring to us and educate us and help us understand. Uh, we, a mentor to our friends and family and colleagues abroad, we do need your support and help uh, for these uh, Palestinian accountability, Palestinian Authority account accountability and reform initiative, uh, and also the Arabic Communication Center, which we're setting up as we speak. Uh, this, will, uh, this will allow us to lead the fight against the Hamas and Iranian regime disinformation campaign, which has been an enormous part of this war. And, and uh, we've, it, we've been yeah. facing it for years, but now there's a watershed moment where we can, uh, we can turn the tide and we can win that war. And we're gonna, we've taken the position to lead that war together with our, uh, our Arabic experts, uh, uh, Khalid and Yossi Kuperwasser and Pinchas Inbari and Aviram uh, Belaish uh, and Jacques Neria uh, and uh, Yonatan Alevi and, and our, our, our uh, Persian experts, Mickey Siegel uh, and others. We really have, we, we have a long list of, uh, of Arabic experts and uh, we want very, very much uh, to uh, allow us uh, to take back the night and, uh, uh, and win this, uh, this is a, an existential issue for, our, for Israel today. Uh, and uh, we need your help and partnership to do it. Thank you all very much. We'll see you tomorrow, God willing at four o'clock p.m., nine o'clock a.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time and six o'clock uh, in Pacific Time. Tomorrow for a very short, for a very yeah. short update before very Shabbat. Very short update before Shabbat.